curious about sort of your history in broadcast. Yeah. Tell me how it all got started. Yeah, so um, I've always been a big talker, and (laughs) I thought I was going to be a doctor, Mm -hmm. and my English teacher said, no, you should be a journalist, and I said, hmm, good idea, because I've done speaking, public speaking, since Mm -hmm. I was two. Uh, So it's just a thing that I've been trained to do, and so I went on to uh, USM in Hattiesburg, and then I... um, got a broadcast journalism degree and a double minor in Spanish-English. And then uh, I failed miserably uh, getting out of school because um, I thought that they were going to be knocking down my doors since I had the 4.0 GPA. But I ended up working at um, McRae's in Columbus Mm -hmm. in retail. And then I got a job as a DJ, and Mm -hmm. I was Lady Love. So (laughs) I thought, hmm, all of those years of hard studying to say I'm Lady Love. (laughs) So that didn't work out. So then I went to work at WCBI for free. And and then like uh, four weeks after, they gave me a job as a producer. But I knew that I didn't want to be behind the camera so vain. (laughs) So uh, one day, um, there was a plane crash at the Columbus Air Force Base. And they didn't have anyone in the newsroom. And they said, we don't have anyone to send out. And I said, oh, me, me, please send me. (laughs) And uh, they said, but you've never been on the air. I said, but I'm ready. And it was true because I'd been standing in front of my mirror with a brush saying, if a plane crashes, I'm going to say this. And if a car crashes, I'm going to say this. And so I got out there and I was, if I should say so myself, flawless. (laughs) So then the next day, they gave me a job as a reporter. And then six months later, I was on the air with Bill Gamble every morning on WCBI for four years, giving the news to people I grew up with. So it was great because it was where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, really. Uh, And then um, I decided, well, I want to spread my wings. Mm -hmm. So I went to Lexington to work with ABC and it turned out to be the worst move I could have ever made. Because they have city county taxes in in uh, Lexington, so the big ten thousand dollar raise I thought I was getting was actually less than what I was making mm-hmm. at WCBI. And then they had snow and ice, and I found out I was expecting a honeymoon baby, and I just <laughs> left all of my family. Right. And so um, things got really bad. Mm-hmm. And I ended up on a farm in Frankfort, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And um, we were literally on this one particular Saturday sitting in the dark because I could not pay my light bill. Right. And I was eight months pregnant with a bag of oranges and box of crackers in my pantry. Right. And uh, I had decided to get out of news because I said, who was I to think I could be a journalist anywhere but Mississippi? Right. And uh, I went to my landlady. Her name was Elois Peach. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had only met her once, and I got her keys and then dodged her for five months because I didn't have rent. Right. So um, $3,200 yeah. in the hole on rent. I went back to her, and I said, we can't make it. I had called Walmart and Amory to right. see if I could be a cashier, and I was going to give up on everything. And I'd already mapped it out. We packed up my little Ford Escort, and we were headed back home. I'd actually, that same day, gone to the check-in-to-cash place Mm -hmm. to get $100 at 380% interest to drive back to Amory. And uh, she said, um, she listened to me, and I said, we'll find a way to pay you back, but we're just really broke right now, and we don't even have food to eat. And she said... um, Okay, so then I walked out to my car, and she chased me out to my car, and I said, oh my gosh, this little white lady's going to sue me, and I'm just a little (laughs) black girl from southern Mississippi, and she said, no, no, come back and sit in my office, and she said, your future, your future is so bright, it burns my eyes. And she said, one day you're going to help thousands of people, but today I need to help you. So she told me, go home, write down every bill that I had. It was Mm $28,751.62. And Elois Peach took a check out of her checkbook and wrote me a check for $28,751.62 and wiped my slate clean. And she said, you're destined to help other people, and all I want you to do is find a way to help them. And so over the years, I did end up paying her back. And she um, taught me how to control my finances Mm -hmm. and 
you know, I was eventually able to become a homeowner because of the lessons that she gave me. But in that, she also gave me the power to change. And so she said, you're going to find a way to help others. I went to Louisville to the NBC affiliate. They told me I would be the troubleshooter. And I found that I was helping people and reporting on it. And I said, wait a minute. Like five years ago, this woman gave me money and said I'd be helping others. So she was able to peep into my future and see what I would be doing. So when my blood pressure went through the roof um, as a reporter, as a troubleshooter, I had to give it up because my doctor said, you're really good at what you do, but when you die of a stroke, you're going to be replaced. Right. And he said, so I would choose life. So I left, but I realized that Elois Peach had given me the power uh, to change my life, and now I could empower others. So we started my company, and that's how we got to the show. So I know I took you through a lot of terms, You're but that's, to, that's, that's the long answer. <laughs> and so do you, do you still keep in touch with Ms. Peach? Well, actually, she passed away of mm -hmm. breast cancer four years ago, but not before she was able to see me. And she'd say, I saw you when you helped the blind lady, and I saw <laughs> you when you helped that guy get his car back. So she was able to see... Um, her legacy paid forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we started my company, Power to Change Communications, mm -hmm. it was a tribute right. to her legacy because I know she's somewhere in heaven going, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and um, we took a two two year break from the show or from TV, but I really missed it, and that's when we launched the talk show. But I brought her entire family in, and everywhere I go, I want people to understand that this that I'm doing is not just something that I'm doing. I mean, it is a purpose-filled life that I'm just playing out really, because I know I'm here um, to empower people. And I had to go through that experience on the farm to appreciate right. the journey. Right. And tell me about the show, about how that got started. Yeah, so um, to, after the two-year hiatus, we launched this show, and I said, um, I want to do a talk show. And I'd left a six-figure job and benefits, and people right. said, you're crazy. You're not going to be able to start a talk show. <laughs> but I cashed out my 401K, my Roth IRA, everything mm -hmm. I had, and said, I'm going to put this behind my dreams. So we came up with the title for the show, which initially was called Power to Change. Right. And... Um, we uh, built a set, we had a set designed, and then I went and knocked on every door possible and got the sponsorship, and then we um, got a television station to air the show, and we launched and we taped, and I went back and looked at the tape after spending $16,000, and there was no audio. <laughs> wow. No audio. And uh, so I went in my closet and determined that I would not come out ever again. <laughs> and it was my sister, who's a teacher, a, a, a principal in Amory. And she said, hmm, well, I guess you should quit. But she said, I, I wonder if Oprah had quit, you know, when yeah. they fired her and demoted her, yeah. um, where, where she would be now. And what if Michael Jordan had quit when he was, you know, kicked off the 10th grade team? So she starts going through all of the people that she knows I admire. Right. And so um, I got back in the saddle, <laughs> and uh, we taped again in that December. And then uh, we were off and running, and so we've been doing that. And uh, we were picked up by a couple of markets, um, Louisville, Norfolk, Virginia, and Lexington, Kentucky. But then uh, this past summer, I went to Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, we are going to go for it. So we competed against 75 other shows, and we won the top prize. Wow. So that landed me in the office of Paramount and Warner right. Brothers and all of these people that could totally change my life. And they loved it. They loved the concept, loved the show. And so we were able to partner with the parent company of mm -hmm. the station I'm at, my, my headquarters, Raycom Media, mm -hmm. and they did our first phase of expansion, so we're in 20 cities and 10 states. 
uh, to include home. So we're we're back here. It took yeah. 16 years. I've been <laughs> off the air for 16 <laughs> years, but but we are back here. And it's so delightful because this is home. Right. And so we've been to Hollywood and L.A. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're going home to Mississippi. <laughs> so I was most excited that my mom would, you know, be able to wake up and get to see me yeah. again. So that's yeah. really cool. You can expect to see people, real people, who turn obstacles into opportunities. And uh, just like what happened to me on that farm, People have, I mean, you can be going through life and then just life happens. You know, there's no way to control it. And if it hasn't happened to you, you haven't lived long enough because it will. It just will. And so the show is all about those defining moments right. in life that could make or break you. And if it doesn't break you, how you find a way to get out of it mm -hmm. and then not only empower yourself but others. So like this uh, episode that um, aired this past weekend, mm -hmm. we, we interviewed Jared Fogle, the mm -hmm. subway guy. Right. And what a lot of people don't know is that he ended up almost running off a cliff. Right. And it was that that made him say, I've got to do something about my weight right. because his weight was causing sleep apnea. Right. And the week before that, we interviewed Ted Williams, who was the golden voice and was on Oprah and Dr. Phil and all of those folks. And he was discovered on a corner mm -hmm. and had this amazing voice. And um, he went to Hollywood and fell again. And so we caught him after a two-year break from mm -hmm. the world. And he was back in radio. So it's those kinds of just real people with amazing stories mm -hmm. of defining change. And um, we, we understand that TV has to be sexy and it has to have shock and awe. And people even told me when we started, they said positive TV will never work. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a world where reality TV is king, people want to see others cursing each other. Right. You've got to throw some skillets and balls right. and all right. kinds of things. And I said, no, but I think in what is a very depressed economy where people are told no and their homes are being foreclosed on and, you know, their kids are, are losing scholarships and they can barely eat and they have no hope, people want to have hope. And so what we do is we shock you, we awe you, but we also motivate and inspire you so that... When you leave that show, you say, man, did you see what Sheena did right. and how she was able to get out of that? And you leave empowered. And then the show has a really interesting, what we think is a niche, in that it's not just a 30-minute show where Sharla says, you can be empowered, and then we go away, and you don't <laughs> see us until next Sunday. Right. We actually have power movements. We have... Um, power in 60, which is um, power over 60, which is for seniors, you know, mm -hmm. where they can get involved and they can show how they're using their power. We have power in wellness where we do boot camps and people lose weight. And and we, um, we had 25 people in Louisville who lost 876 pounds wow. in six weeks. <laughs> So it was totally like amazing change. So outside of the show, we wanted to make it in action. And then Charlotte's Angels mm -hmm. is the nonprofit arm of the show. And uh, my dad, Charlie, mm -hmm. I lost him two years ago, mm -hmm. but he was known throughout the community, I think it's in my DNA, to help people. Mm -hmm. And so Charla's Angels is a playoff of Charlie's Angels. Right. And uh, so like today, we went over to the Salvation Army and we uh, spent an hour at their soup kitchen and we donated twin bed sheets and pillowcases. Mm -hmm. And so we have angels all over Tupelo, all over right. Amory, all over the country who have decided that they want to become a part of this power movement mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we can not only talk about change, but we can be the change we want to see in this world. So it's really cool to see people say, sign me up. Here's my name and my number. Tell me when you're doing something in the community. And this is kind of like a grassroots effort. Right. Uh, to win viewers and win hearts and to win soldiers who want to fight what is an ever-increasing battle, you know, with our kids falling prey to drugs and, you know, alcoholism and all of these kinds of crazy things. 
And I think this is, you know, someone said, is it time for this kind of show and this kind of messaging? And I say, absolutely. It's time.